Here's the question. Are our leaders prepared to effectively address our global challenges? And does capitalism need to change for their efforts to be successful? In this episode, Stephen Young, Global Executive Director of the Cow Round Table for Moral Capitalism, returns to explore these issues and more, as we also discuss the 2020 World Economic Forum at Davos, the U.S. Business Round Table, and the efforts of CA in the adoption of moral capitalism by these bodies. My name is Alan Fine. Welcome to the Global Benefit Podcast, where we lead conversations toward the health, harmony, and security of the world. Media addiction is a major problem. Being responsible media creators, we recommend you take regular breaks from all media, including this show, to develop yourself and be an active participant in the world. Excessive media consumption will negatively impact your life. So please watch responsibly. Welcome, Steve. I was thinking when I was uh, looking at what's happening with Davos, that the conference that you had here in Minneapolis a few weeks ago was kind of like a mini Davos. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit about what that conference was about, who attended. Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind, Alan, and it's great to be back with you, is Davos versus sort of the rest of the world. I think one of the things that has evolved in the last couple of decades, I think Davos has been going on maybe 30 years or more, 40 years. I don't know. This man, Klaus Schwab. 1971 is what I is understand. It's a long, long time. It's almost 50 years. Yeah. yeah. And I, then Klaus must be pretty old. Um, it, it has evolved. I mean, with the, the criticism of Davos that I've picked up, and it, it fits with what's going on in America with sort of Trump and the deplorables versus an elite. It's the notion of, and the, the top 1% that we're talking about. Davos is a gathering of sort of the top 1% or 1% of the top 1%. And you have to pay something like $3,000 to attend. And then you've got to have hotel and flights into this little town in Switzerland. And on the one hand, it's a gathering of, of people who have influence, who, have, who are very smart, many of them. It's also celebrities showing off. And I, I think one of the, the, the challenges, and this is somehow core to ethics, I think, in, in who we are as people in all our societies. I mean, we have smart people and we have people who are not so smart. We have wealthy people and we have people who are poor. We have all kinds of people. They have different religions, different mm -hmm. ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. um, who should be at the table when, when we're talking about, about the way our lives should be run in terms of capitalism or in terms of politics? And that's a not an easy question to answer. Well, we should, we should clarify that the World Economic Forum, too, is an NGO. It's an NGO based in and, Davos, right? It has lots of money. And Davos is actually a resort. It's a resort area right in Switzerland. And they have this gathering every January of these very wealthy, influential people. And the interesting thing, though, is there's heads of state, there's heads of corporations, and evidently they have a badge system where well, they... Yeah, there's, there's a real hierarchy, social... Hierarchy, pro right. and, I mean, to me, in some ways, it's a, like a classical European court or Chinese court where the mandarins were ranked in nine degrees and right. if you're a seventh degree mandarin you can't stand next to an eighth degree mandarin it's all that kind of stuff so it's like there's access for certain levels versus and others but but what i understand though about davos though is is that the uh the speeches are just one small part of it that there's a huge networking opportunity in one place and so that's too. why a lot of people go for networking so it's an insider thing so um the co they've never really warmed up or opened up much to the co-roundtable, and we're a very different scale. Um, but we, too, have our gatherings and discussions. Now, the good side, I would say, of Davos and the co-roundtable is it's, it's, it's settings in, in which people bring ideas and problems and suggestions together. Um, and the fundamental parameter is more like open discussion, open dialogue. Not, not the, the, you know, the great person tells you what to do. It's not, it's not really a hierarchy. It's open to the genius of the human mind, where you can say something, and I don't necessarily have to agree with you. And we can argue or we can come to some uh, joint, or I can change my mind having, mm -hmm. having listened to you. So what, we had a, a, an event here in Minnesota, uh, which really had a, a local objective, a Minnesota objective, but in the context of these larger issues of, about systems. 
Uh, so in that sense, it's uh, sort of a mini Davos. We brought different people together. The event was the 25th anniversary of the co-roundtable principles, which were first published in 1994. And as some of your listeners may know, that very recently, last August and then just a couple of weeks ago, in August, the U.S. Business Roundtable, organization of some 200 American CEOs of very big companies, and then in December, Davos itself, or the World Economic Forum, or Klaus Schwab, writing mm-hmm. for the World Economic came up with statements really redescribing capitalism as, as a networking system, not as a system, as Karl Marx used to talk about, as an extraction of wealth mm-hmm. sort of through a corporate uh, entity, a business entity, up to a few owners who were the capitalists. But this new idea is more business and, and a corporation is a networking system, of, and the term that's used is stakeholders. And... So we brought people together. Now, our particular objective here in Minnesota was to try to create something where the, the new generation of business leaders, CEOs, senior officers, boards of directors, but hopefully down through you know, all the different people who work in the companies, um, to recognize that Minnesota has had a very high standard of corporate responsibility in its companies, going back to sort of old family companies like the Daytons and the Pillsburys and many others. Mm -hmm. Um, But this tradition is at risk of being forgotten because the people who were brought up in the value scheme of the older generation prior to the baby boomers, they passed on. And as most people know, baby boomers have been described many, many times as the me generation. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a baby boomer and then maybe younger cohorts – Gen X, Gen Y, millennials, uh, there's a real emphasis on me rather than on us. So we wanted to try to do something to create a, an awareness and build hopefully a culture more of us for the, the younger people who are now rising, who are in their 50s and 60s now, who are rising up to become business leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did this by giving an award in a name for the Dayton family as sort of a, a role model of how you can make money and also at the same time take care of your customers, your employees, the environment, arts and culture in your community. And hopefully we'll be doing that every year as we, as we go on. And then we had Paul Pullman, the former uh, CEO of Unilever, who's now the chairman of the International Chamber of Commerce, come to speak. And the feedback I got from people was that, that, that they were impressed, that they, they were moved in the right kind of sense to think more about us, business as part of an us, rather than business is all about me. Well, it was an amazing event, actually, because there, there were so many Fortune 500 CEOs, in essence, in attendance there. Uh, and then there were people that flew in from all over the world, from France, from Mexico. Uh, Paul Pullman came from London. Uh, it was a very impressive event. And well, you're all, when you talk about people from other places, we, we attached onto this our sort of annu- our annual global dialogue, which is... More like it's, it's not a Davos because it's not a big celebrity thing. It's trying to bring people, individuals who have experience, and it's open-ended, anybody can come, uh, to come and share their thoughts on sort of themes which, which we pick. Um, now, this is kind of interesting. Now, this leads back to something you were saying earlier. Who has a place at the table? And in Davos, there's definitely a hierarchical structure. But then the question is, is who should be at that table? Uh, and that and that is as the great issues of politics and culture at all times, especially in our times, with emphasis on marginalized people, on uh, in America identity politics, questions of white privilege or male privilege. In the world, we used to talk about the first world and then the third world. Um, now, now, now it's north south, and the people from the quote unquote south, which were the non European, non industrialized countries, uh, which were also in many cases the colonial. Uh, uh, areas in the 19th, early 20th century, they have a feeling that they should be at the table. And the main organization I think we have for that is the United Nations, where every country gets one vote. Uh, And then we have other things like the World Trade Organization and and the World Health Organization, International Red Cross. Um, So I think it's, it's it's always a very open question, you know, who should be at the table, who wants to be at the table. Another factor, though, which is... Is, is important, but it's, it's hard because part of should, I think, re- needs to reflect on your abilities, your merits, your talents. Just because 
frankly, I've had this reaction recently to this young woman, Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, very different from a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. She's a nice young girl. She's filled with emotion. She's very frightened about what's going to happen. But as far as I can tell, she doesn't know anything. She's 16 years old. And so should she really have that prominent place going to adults and wagging her finger and saying, you all have failed? Uh, She doesn't have any solutions to global warming. So if somebody is, um, you know, let's say comes, I suppose these days the, the main thrust is populism. Ordinary people should be at the table and they should, just, they should be listened to. But what if somebody's not ordinary? They're a crown prince or a princess or something like that. Right. But they've, got, they've really studied. They've got a good idea. They're very smart. Should they not be at the table? It's a good question. I mean, there's another side, though, too, and that is that Greta Thunberg may be reflecting the way a lot of young people feel about the future, you know, because of all of the alarms that have been sounded about the potential devastating impacts of, of the environmental devastation that's occurring right now. And so that reflection is important to be heard, that perception. But, that, but, but So you've got two things now. You've got one perception. Right. So then there are issues of, is the perception credible? Is it accurate? Um, there's another issue of if young people have that perception and they're scared, they, they, you know, there's some need for parental people, if you will, to respond, to institutions to respond. But who, who should make decisions? Should decisions rest on emotionalism? Or should decisions rest on something else? Should decisions flow from ideology? Or should decisions flow from compromise? I don't think we as a human you know, race really have a lot of good answers to these questions. We kind of struggle and we muddle through. Uh, some of us think one way, others people think, and then you, people who are really passionate, they try to gain power, right? Political power, military power, money power, uh, emotional power. Well, now, now we're sort of getting into also the, just this whole idea of, of uh, what makes someone capable of sitting at the table. And, uh, and is it dependent upon age? Is it dependent upon experience? I mean, somebody could be delivering the mail for 50 years and not necessarily have the greatest experience and, and, or and, knowledge and, and, about the, what's going on. And somebody else that's and 20 years old could be very right, well read. Right, right. <laughs> and, and we have theories about this from different cultures over, over the millennia. And we have, we have different systems. Yeah. I think the answer we've created as a species is we have systems. We select, we sort. And then other people who are usually the ones who are left out, the left behinds, the, the proletariat, the farmers, uh, whoever it is, um, they, they protest saying your sorting system, your voting system, your social status, your, the aristocracy of the French Bourbon kings before yeah. the revolution, uh, the capitalists in Marx's analysis of just get rid of the capitalists and no private property and the proletariat will, will, will rule. Interestingly, that never really happened because large masses of people can't effectively be at the table and make decisions. So Lenin came up with this little version called the Vanguard Party. That a smaller group of people would, would reflect the proletariat. Yeah. They, would, they would know somehow what the proletariat really wants. And that, of course, led under Lenin and Stalin and Mao and others to tremendous inequality of power, brutality, cruelty, concentration camps, because if you didn't think the right way, then not only were you not at the table, you didn't deserve to live. And then, of course, Hitler had a similar phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Uh, with, with he had his leading vanguard party of, of Aryan Germans. And what did they do to people who were very different from them, the Jews? I mean, they just said, you, you're, I think the first step was then in, in this at-the-table concept, the Nuremberg Laws, mm-hmm. I think of 33 and 34, where they made it, the Germans, the Aryans, who had the military and political power, they made a distinction between citizenship and something. And some sort of an a, a I, defined ethnicity. I think it was called Staatsengehörige or something like that, mm-hmm. which meant in English something more like resident. All the rights went to the citizens. And you had to be of German Aryan descent to be a citizen. If you weren't that, if you were Jewish, if you were a gypsy or something, mm-hmm. you were Statsengehoga, and you had no rights. And ultimately, you even lost the right to live. Um, and that's all because of some vanguard party deciding they were the only ones who could sit at the table. You know, if we look at presidential elections in the United States, the basic concerns that people have 
today just with regard to themselves, seeing themselves in essence in a bubble and trying to figure out how do I live, how do I survive in this world. This young generation, if they're going to college, they're building up lots of personal debt. They're trying to figure out how to survive in the world. And they're hearing about all of these major challenges that we're facing. But when we look at, for example, the conference in Davos and 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 the Ka conference that was here, uh, most of the people there are over probably 45 years old. Or at least. Maybe at least, averaging yeah, 55, yeah. 60 yeah, maybe, or more. Maybe, yeah. Uh, but this younger generation is going to be leading the future. And so if they don't have a presence there, they're not being nurtured through these processes. Are we... Well, on track to building. But this is, the, I mean, this these are great issues, which, which I mean, great in I mean, terms I, of significant, well, but well, not well, talked well, about very much. Well, when you mention, though, about, for example, you know, the limited knowledge that, for example, Greta Thunberg has, um, the interesting question that comes to my mind is how much mentorship are we giving? I think that to is, these, to some extent, that generation? is the question. That is the question, because the, from my point of view, and I'm, older and, and more traditional in my understanding of anthropology and sociology and politics is that the human person develops over time and requires mentoring, requires family, requires a number of things so that our minds can develop in many, many ways. Both we have self-interest, you know, how do we learn what is wise for us? There's the question of ethics and morality. The, the thing, I'm jumping a little bit, Alan, on this, mm -hmm. but with the younger generation that, that I see, particularly in America, I think we're a leading edge with this, with social media and celebrity, is how lonely and isolated Americans are and young Americans. If you look at these, these uh, signs of, of depression and despair, the opioid crisis, for that's older, but um, the, the, well, well, we the, could, thinness, could, the thinness of relationships. Yeah. I mean, a hookup culture... Boys and girls, you know, young men, young women, they go, they meet each other, they go off and they have fun for a night and then they never see each other again. That's, that doesn't really reinforce for either the man or the woman or the two men or the two girls or whatever it is, a sense that I'm important. Well, they talk about uh, ghosting, decline in, in religious observance, which means the lack of maybe community cohesion. Lack of family, family breakdown. Family breakdown. The, the other um, and, thing, then, and, then, and then media addiction. And media addiction and social media, all of which is creating this younger generation, will, which at some time will take over. That's inevitable. It's I mean, self-isolated. But it's self-isolated. <laughs> and and, and as, as, as you were saying, they weren't mentored. They're not happy people. There's a massive sense of victimization. So at the same time, that sense of being a victim leads to demands that I am at the table. Whereas the people throughout history mm -hmm. who, have, who have made a difference for good have had a sense of maturity about them, I think. They, they did not see themselves as victims. They saw themselves as somehow as capable. The phrase that's out there is they have agency, well, and actually, which I don't you, like that word because agency right. means you work for somebody else. But when you victimize yourself also, then somebody else has to be the enemy. So that increases the enemy thing, and then it, it, it increases you, the, emotion, the emotional intensity of your life without giving you any firm ground. Mm -hmm. So the more you go, the more, the more you feel like a victim. The more, therefore, you need solace and consolation from what? From, from sex, from drugs, from being nasty over the Internet. I think a lot of the nastiness that the social media and the internet has opened up is driven by my need to lash out. I'm an unhappy person. So I see something you've posted on Facebook or some Twitter. So I go back to you, whom I have no idea who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're a good person or a bad person. I just see this thing and I say, oh, he's a white racist guy. So I smear you for being a white racist. And then what I've seen is the tit-for-tat reality. And then you come back at me, accusing me of being whatever, whatever. And then I go back to you. Both of us end up feeling more alienated, more bitter, more alone, more isolated. This is really a dumb system, if you ask me. Well, and it's a system that wasn't designed. It's a system that was marketed for purposes of, of enriching people that were m manipulating and using that system, but there's a sociological impact that all of this media has had on these younger generations. Yes. It's very yes. different than what we experienced. I mean, when we were young, 
we didn't have all of these social media, any of these social media tools. So I mean, we, when, we I, when I was growing up, we interacted with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other, thing, well, that's another thing is is when we were growing up, when families were more intact, um, and you had three, you only had three TV stations to you had NBC, ABC, CBS, and then later on you had public television, and you had to you had to read newspapers and books. That's all you had, and comic books. That's all you had, and you went out and played rather than sitting. And you and you and you played with and you and so when you were when you were six eight years old, and the little boys were were playing cowboys and Indians, and the little girls were doing Mm -hmm. dollhouses or whatever, um, horses. When I was in elementary school, the girls were really into horses. They'd all have little horses and they'd play around. You were learning social relations. You were learning social skills, Mm -hmm. face to face social skills. you were learning how to use words, and and in, when when families actually had meals together, mom and dad and the kids, and sometimes the grandparents, uh, you would learn the how to be at the table. Actually, as we were growing up, we heard about the terrible things about radio and television that it was taking our time away <laughs> from everything. But we were still watching it together. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> now people just sit inside of a room by themselves. I had a um, and binge watch something. Right, right. No, I had I had a, a friend of mine the other year who told me he was he went to. Uh, some sort of bar in Minneapolis, I think, and he was sitting there with another friend, and they were just sort of talking, and f- I think four young women walk in, and they take the four seats next to him at the bar, and each woman is walking in carrying her cell phone. And then they sit down. They're obviously friends. They've come as a group. They each sit down, and they're focusing and concentrating on their cell phone. There's no- nothing horizontal. They don't talk to each other. They don't do this. They don't. They order their drink, and then... My friend overhears the second woman down, looking at her cell phone, say to the first one, the woman to her left, say, oh, did you see my, my text yet? Mm-hmm. And, the, and the woman who's sitting right next to her, looking down at her cell phone, not turning her head to look at the friend, she just says, no, I haven't. Oh, here it is. So she then reads what her friend who's sitting next to her has texted, and she texts back. And my friend was stunned. I mean, here are people who are capable right. of speaking, who are capable of interacting, and they're interacting with each other. They're, they're two feet apart, and they're, and they're using an Internet connection, which goes somewhere. And if that's the metaphor, and that's a global metaphor, that's happening all over the world to the younger generation. So the cynic in me says, we really need to ask those young people, if you want to be in the ta- at the table, prepare yourselves. Well, but on the other side, though, the interesting part for a lot of these young people, I think, is is – is uh, if they are being isolated, are they actually learning about what's important in life? Uh, how do they, are, do they is, there a, is there a congruent definition that they have? And, uh, and at the same time, when they see opinions that uh, they don't agree with on the internet, like you were talking about, and they spout out something uh, negatively towards somebody they have no idea who's on the other side, do they uh, have some point of reference to understand where that's coming from? Uh, my my, the, my the suspicion I, is no. And, and, su- and so in the context of that too, though, uh, everyone, well, fundamentally, if we were just to talk about what do people generally want? And I would say that people generally want to be included. Uh, they want to be included in the employment population. They want to be included in social situations. They want to be included in the experience of life. And, uh, and, and there are these perspectives with regard to capitalism, for example, or any type of social system uh, that begs the question of, is everyone included in it? Uh, one of my one of my favorite paintings. Uh, and what and what does inclusion mean? And what's the purpose yeah, of that yeah, inclusion? Yeah, yeah. No, but to go to go even below, who are we and what do we want? One of my favorite paintings is by Gauguin. It's in the Boston uh, Institute of Art. It's one of when he was in Tahiti. It's a great big thing. I don't know, ten feet wide, mm-hmm. and he's got three questions in French at the bottom. He's got these odd Tahitian figures and some sort of god and brilliant colors. And it says, "Who are we? Where do we come from? And where are we going?" And who provides answers to those questions these days? If you go to who are me, uh, who are we? What, what is a human being? What do we need? What do we want? And I'd say that, I mean, roughly speaking in all you know, cultures and things like that, mm-hmm. there's sort of, there are two buckets. One bucket is, is a materialistic bucket. 
right? We want good material things. We want food. We want good food. We want money. We want a nice house. We want a nice car. The other bucket, though, which is is harder to kind of get your hands on, is emotional, psychological. We have psychology. We have the Freudian. We have all these people with different kinds of analysis. Uh, we the emotional side of our life. Uh, we want inclusion. We want to avoid emotional pain. We want love. Um, then there's another question. The two buckets also reflect two theories about, about who we are. The materialistic bucket kind of says we're just self-interested creatures um, and I can buy you. Because I know you have some level of need and I can mm-hmm. buy you. Um, and that's all you are. You're just a consumer. And if I can sell you a cell phone and you want to buy it, hey, I'm, I'm done. You're, you know, I've got you. The other concept says we are moral beings. And that's the concept which we've lost sight of. That's the concept which, which um, Aristotle talked about, Mencius talked about in China. I think the Buddha, in his first sermons, he presumes, and Jesus t- is similar to me, uh, and the Jewish tradition. And, but, and I think one of the, 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 the important things about the Old Testament, as a, raised a Christian from the Jewish tradition, is the tension in the conflict that's right in that Old Testament bet- between uh, the moral side of things. Um, I, I was always very impressed with the prophets of ancient Israel who were going to the kings and saying, wait a moment, yeah, yeah, you're building up your army, you want to fight this, you got your women, you got that, um, but God wants you to be a moral person, to take care of the moral needs of, of your people. And I think this modern culture we're talking about, about the young people, is de-emphasizing the moral part of our, of our needs and emphasizing the material part, thereby leaving people unhappy. Because I'm more and more believing that that older tradition about the moral sense is a deep truth about human beings. We've got to recognize you as a moral person and respond, and you need to recognize me as a moral person, and our meeting ground is somewhere on the level of, of mutual respect, not just I buy you and you buy me. Now, there's an interesting question about that perspective. How long has that been around? The, the lack of focus on, on the moral side? Yeah. I think since the 19th century. I think the 19th century intellectual leadership uh, shifted to materialism. Now, how has that affected business? Uh, I think, I mean, this is, I'm oversimplifying, but it's affected capitalism by the justification that the only thing a business should do is make money. And if you make money without breaking the law, as what Milton Friedman said, what, you, what happens to your customers, your employees, your society, the environment, you don't have to worry about it. Because fundamentally, you're not a moral, ethical person. So who worries about it then? Very few people. Well, you, we do get the Greta Thunbergs, and we get, I think there's an inchoate realization which is building, and it's behind mm-hmm. this demand for socialism in America today in our politics from the left, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, uh, Mm-hmm. AOC, her nickname, um, they sense, but it's a sense. It's not a well-thought-out thing. They sense that something is off in the culture and society, that it's not paying attention to the higher goods of life. They're right, but, they don't have, but their solutions are also materialistic. What is their solution? Government should spend more money and tax the rich. But that doesn't get to the moral sense. That doesn't get to the spiritual side of life. In thinking about the dynamic of business and the individual. How do we progress forward with this particular type of system? I mean, that, that again, is a great uh, question. Um, because you just take, now let's inject into the conversation here, this demand for equality of outcomes among all people. If every human being on this planet is going to, because they deserve, because we're all equal. Every human being on this planet is going to have the lifestyle of upper middle class Americans and Europeans. I think the environmentalists say we're going to need five extra planets in order to get the resources. So what are we going to do? Are we going to deny the poor people of China, India, Africa, Latin America, and look at the conditions in Venezuela today and other countries? Um, We're going to deny them to the ability to live in a nice house the way some people have here in, in Minneapolis or St. Paul. Well, we, that's wrong. So we're going to give them the nice house and the cars. Okay, does every family in the world, one car, two cars? Um, and where are the resources going to come from? There's no good answer to that. 
And I think what worries a Greta Thunberg and younger people is they see and they sense that the elites, the adults, the so-called elite and the so-called adults, don't really have good answers to that question. Um, my own sense is that the only way we can do this is, is with new technologies, which, which have to be this concept of a circle economy. But we still have limited resources. Wait, so, so, so you, have to, you have to recycle your resources and you have to reduce your use of resources. But ultimately, though, the world still is finite in terms of resources. We increase population to a certain degree, and we're going to be extending those resources beyond capacity. And from what Paul Pullman mentioned to us at the Car Roundtable event, uh, the date upon which we expand, uh, we expand beyond our capacity, our Earth's capacity to support itself right now, I think, is in July. And, uh, and that so still leaves, a, now that still leaves a, billion, a billion more people very, very poor who don't even have clean water. And on the other side, we have lots of people in parts of the world that play servant roles to other people. Uh, there's cultural dynamics that are established in which there's certain people who are the servant class and certain people who are the ruling class in many places around the world. There's a whole cultural mechanism that needs to change. So we've got this cultural mechanism in a lot of these places. Then we've got what's happening with our youth and their disconnect from themselves, from society that's occurring right now. We have some big challenges that we're facing just culturally. And uh, maybe we'll explore those further in the next segment. So we're going to take a five minute break <laughs> and we encourage our <laughs> listeners to take a five minute break also.
Welcome back. We're here with Steve Young, uh, Global Executive Director of the Chiron Table for Moral Capitalism. And uh, we left off the last segment talking about the dynamics of culture. One of the things that I think is a, is a, a deep source of dysfunction and alienation and loneliness is what is called postmodernist theory or deconstruction theory, um, which you can trace back to Nietzsche in the 19th century, who basically blew away morality and ethics. He said, I don't believe in all this crap. It's all about me and what I want to think. So from this perspective... Which so come, what do you mean by that? I don't, I'm not following. Whatever I think is reality, nihilism, there is no truth. So it's all relative. It's, all, it's all, more than relative. It's just whatever you want to make it to be. And therefore Nietzsche took that um, to the point about power. So uh, whoever has power gets to impose their view of reality. What has come down to us in the last 20, 30 years from the, from the French uh, you know, deconstruction theorist, theorists... Derrida and Foucault is this notion of the, the social construction of, of reality. There is no truth. It's all social convention. It's all a narrative. You hear more and more and more, particularly from academics and others, and particularly people on the left, AOC, well, it's just, it's just your narrative, Alan, which is a way of saying, yes, it's your perception. I recognize it. It's your authentic perception, but it's only yours. You don't have the truth. Um, but, if, but if we only have perceptions, how do we function as a society? If that, that, that's, individual that's right. That, that's, that's where, the, that's where this, this, this philosophy has led us to, is this breakdown in isolation and individualism, where, where we, we've given up on the search that we can actually collectively find a reality which is, which is acceptable, which then circles back to the problem we were talking about of who should be at the table. If, if everything is relative, then, then nobody really should be at the table because all they bring is their own narrative and all they bring is their own power. So we, now we have these ideologies about white privilege and male privilege and this and this and this, which are deconstructing the right of those people to be at the table. But when, if you have a million people and you have a million different narratives, you, you don't have a society, you don't have a culture, you have chaos, you, and you have, no moral, you have no moral glue bringing us together where we can experience love and affection and bonding and, and care for each other. And, and so, if, it's, and, so it's a mess. And, it's a mess. And here's something interesting. And in just what you just mentioned, love, caring, bond with each other. When we talk about meaning of life, you know, when a per, if a person is fulfilled, is that fulfillment? Well, having your own narrative? No. Is fulfillment, love, caring, bonding with each other, is that the primary thing that all of us really seek? And that all of these other things are just peripheral things? Well, I mean... I don't really I, know. I, I mean, mean I mean, is the point of society to yeah, help I'm, us I mean, to... I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm a lawyer, and I study history and jurisprudence and stuff like that, basically. But I mean, the older philosophers, whom I don't even, even think we teach them to the young people anymore, uh, I'm thinking about Plato writing in the Republic and, and then Aristotle, and then on the Chinese side, you have Buddhism and, and, and the Quran. Mm -hmm. and all, but Plato... I think, I mean, as I remember, um, a good friend of mine, Frank Fukuyama, who's a, pre a professor now at Hoover Institution, Stanford, has recently written, written a book on the third aspect of human nature, according to Plato. But Plato said to, be, to have a meaningful life, there are three things you have to manage. One is sort of your emotions and your, and, and your psyche. Um, the other thing you have to manage is your reason of uh, finding truth believing that two plus two really is four. And then the third mm -hmm. thing, I think it's called timos, is your sense of, of worth and being recognized and being important. And I think where Plato ends up, uh, according to Frank, is that these three things need to be kept in balance. You need all three. And I would also add, uh, uh, and Abraham Maslow more recently, has his hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. You have to add a Good base, of, a, a base of, of just materialism. But there's belongingness needs. Belongingness, there's material. I mean, you need food and water. You need belongingness. You there's also, esteem needs. There's esteem needs. There are intellectual needs. You need to challenge your brain. Well, the, and those self-actualization or intellectual needs too, all three of them, wouldn't you say they're all society-based? They all, they all need society. In order for you to fulfill those. Yourself. So, so there's, this, there's this duality among the human, uh, within each human person. We are independent. We are autonomous. We are free. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody can tell us what to think, right? They can try, but ultimately it's up to us. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we, we only find meaning in context with other people, with culture, with society, with family, with friends, with spouses, as part of the, the tribe. 
uh, that's another point we didn't mention earlier, Alan, that, that this rise of tribalism in, in the you know, early decades of the 21st century is, I think, related to this fear of loneliness and isolation, and we're unhappy. Well, interestingly enough, when I look at young people today, and I, I work with a bunch of them all the time because I, I you teach, teach them at you the, teach in the university. <laughs> yeah. I've had over 10,000 over the last 25 years. And uh, with media, what is basically done is, I believe, over the last 25 years, is it's reduced attention span. Yes, I agree. I agree. I and, agree. And uh, especially amongst the younger population. And in, in essence, it's, it's interesting. When we take a break in class, I automatically see, usually, most all the students pull out their phones and start browsing. If I ask them what it is they're browsing, some are looking at YouTube videos, they're checking emails, and so on and so forth. They don't want to take a moment to actually have empty space to think. The whole concept of being bored. Is it okay to be bored? Or is it okay to just sit back and just learn by discovery? Because you're afraid of the void that's within. Right. But the, the interesting thing is, is that if people are in a mode where they need this pacifier to fill the void, then... Uh, that's a good phrase, pacifier. I hadn't thought of that. That's a very good phrase. Well, then, what are, what are, how are they going to build any type of skill if they're constantly bombarded with these pacifiers? Yeah, they won't. They won't. And then... Uh, then, in essence, on one side, we talk about this whole idea of self-actualization, of building community, and so on and so forth. But on the other side, this concept of all of this media being, in essence, an immediate pacifier. I think of it like you drink alcohol, you get drunk, you feel maybe they feel better temporarily. Right, what do they call it? It's self-medication of pain. Right, and so, in essence, the media, drugs, alcohol... All of these things are things that help a person cope with that moment in reality. There are, and, two, there are two other and, things, Alan, well, which, which go to... I just yeah. want to mention one thing in association with that, too. Mm -hmm. And then that person usually needs more and more of that in order to continue to cope. And then once they look back, they say to themselves, Wow, I haven't been doing anything for the past week, month, year, five years, ten years. So then they indulge even more in separating themselves from reality and from community and from building themselves and so on and so forth. And hence we see huge problems with mental health, physical health um, that permeates a lot of Western society today. Uh, and then we have these big issues that we need to address and we need qualified people and talented people to address these issues. But are we building a future with a dearth of leaders yes. that are going to be required to address these issues. So we should talk about just look, I mean, look around our world, and there are two other things which, listening to you, it, it comes to mind. That I think, for, and this is true, I mean, I know people in our co-roundtable work all around the world, different cultures, different religions, and so there's some, you get some uh, sensation in your fingertips for what people are like. Uh, it's not deep study, but there's something. And one of the things I notice in many situations that if you feel hollow inside, if, if, you, if you're an unhappy person, if there's some dysfunction, if there's anger and resentment or whatever, there are two other things that you use for self-medication to, to, to deaden the pain. One is money and the other is power. And, and I think this is a deep truth about human beings. Lord Acton, the British guy, you know, all power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you, ha if you are unhappy inside, if there's something not balanced, uh, then, then you will use money, even though that extra dollar, it doesn't really make any difference to you. Uh, you will use power. And when you get power, you will use it not in nice ways. On another basis... When we think about celebrity endorsements, and you see somebody who sees a perfume from a famous singer or something, and they think to themselves, well, if I wear that perfume, I'm automatically going to somehow enhance myself. I don't know if this is true for you, but when I was a kid, when I'd go and buy a pair of jeans, I would tear off the labels. Uh, and as a matter of fact, all my friends would do that as well. Today, everyone wants to show the labels. They'll, they'll 
you know, present them in, in huge letters on, on, on the and things that they wear. Alan, the, the other year, there was a big advertising, outside advertising. And was that the case for you too, though, when you were well, a kid? Well, let me get back to that. Okay, but, okay. but just your, your point about uh, today, a um, great big um, sort of advertising board in a, over an intersection near a college in, in St. Paul, where I live, where uh, for a big mall, advertising for Mall of America, which is what, the largest mall in the Western Hemisphere or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it said something like, be the best, uh, be the best, your, be, be your best self. So that's, I, th- I saw that great big letters. And I said, well, that's kind of a good message. Then I looked at the bottom half of the board, which were, which were clothing labels. The implication is to be your best self, you go to Mall of America and you buy Gap or Levi's or Old Navy or this or this. There were only room for five or six. And I said, boy, that's a depressing comment. On, on what's going on because you're you're that on a, as a kid I don't remember that so much uh, I don't think we did that because we didn't have lots of labels back then basically and where where my family lived I mean you had like Sears Roebuck and one or two other stores I mean you had either, I think your choices were Levi and Lee and that was about it well traditionally too we had one parent working we had one parent home oh. we were mixing in the community much yep, more yep yep well, but, but the, now it seems like kids and parents are being driven by media hey here's the new because, gadget the new yeah, product and, but but I come back to a point that you're driven by media if there's emptiness within but my son my middle son Warren when he was 13 or 14, something like that. Um, and Oh, no, he had a job. He was maybe 14 or 15. It was when Jerbo Jeans came in. And, and you know, Warren wanted me to buy him a couple of pair of Jerbo Jeans for school. And Jerbo Jeans, I think, in those days were something like $79. And Levi's were maybe like 25 mm-hmm. And I looked at them. It was at some store I looked at. The only difference I could see is the Jerbo jeans had the name of Jerbo on the fly for men's pants, right? And Levi's had the patch on the back pocket. Right. And, but otherwise, they're the same jeans. So I, I didn't want to spend $79. I was, you know. so, I, so I went to my son. I said, look, Warren, let me, let me, let me propose this. Um, as your father, I think you know, I'm responsible for making sure you have enough clothes for school. And I, my guess is that's three pairs of new blue jeans you know, for the upcoming so I'll tell you what, I'll give you $75. You know, that's my money, it's, that's for you. Which in my mind, you can buy three pairs of Levi's or jeans, or Lee's or whatever they were, mm. and fine. If you want to buy one pair of Jerbo, I mean, that's up to you. But you're working. So I'll give you the 75 and then you make your decision. If you want to do, you know, more than one pair of Jerbo, you make up the difference. And I was, at the time, I felt I was taking a, a risk. But it worked, Alan. I was so proud. I was so happy. It worked. My mm-hmm. son says, yes. okay, Dad, I think that's fair. And then he began to calculate what, you know, and I think he ended up with two Levi's and one pair of Jerbo or something. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that, uh, that circles around again to, to capitalism, where if you're a company making Jerbo, uh, competing with the old brands, what do you do? You make, you make something special. You, you make your product into celebrity. You appeal to somebody's anxiety to get them to pay $79 as opposed to the sort of the rational calculating mind, which would say, nah, 25 bucks, I get the same thing. But the Gerbo name is not the same thing as a Levi's name. Well, it's interesting to think about with marketing. Do we have, you know, control over the decisions that we're making because of how we're marketed to this is well, another interesting question. But, but, but I would, I've said for a long time since the, the Marxist criticism of the, the advertising age came up in the 50s is it's like so many things in life, it's interdependent circles. So if I'm a company and I want to sell my Jerbo jeans, what do I do? I hire some marketing professionals. What do they do? They have focus groups and they take surveys and they find out reality. They find out that in reality, a lot of people are anxious and insecure and want status. And the, the, me, the company, I didn't invent that. Mm-hmm. That's the reality. I get this information as facts. I can exploit that information. Now, if the marketing people had done the focus groups and all my potential customers said, no, we're practical people. We just want Levi's. I'm up a creek without a paddle and the water's running out. So is it chicken or is it egg? Is it, is it the customer base and their needs and their desires, which they have the power to change? Or is it me 
using marketing to kind of change the way they think. I, I just, yeah, I'm not sure. Well, this interesting concept of, of, in essence, our drive towards wealth creation. So when we kind of think about capitalism, we could say that it would formally begin, in essence, with democracy, with Adam Smith, right? Wouldn't you say? Capitalism begins with this concept of the invisible hand and how do we function as a society in building... But Adam Smith, and he wrote that book in, um, I think, 1776, late 18th century. I would argue, um, as what I say in my lectures and what I teach, that Smith was really acting as a journalist. He was describing. He was not an inventor. Okay. He was not inventing a system that people should use. He had kind of like woken up one day in England, and there's sort of a truth to this, mm-hmm. um, and suddenly said, what's going on here, especially around Scotland? And his famous description of a pin factory, which, which just clicked his mind that something new and different was going on in his age, which was the Industrial Revolution, which had started sort of on its own in the 1500s. And he made the distinction between before this new thing People made straight pins for sewing. By, they were craft. One person would sit there making each pin, and, a, and a, a worker making pins would make a couple of hundred pins in a day. If you make a factory system, you divide it, you have machinery, you have different special tools, 10 people could make something like 4,000 pins. I mean, the numbers are actually bigger than that, I think. So Smith says we've got something new going on. He, and most people forget, he never used the word capitalism. That comes in the 19th century, most, mostly from Marx. Smith just talked about the system of production, um, which started, if you take it back, and this is the important, it starts in the late 1500s. Now, there is a really important story here, which I think all our intellectuals, all our, everybody sort of overlooked, which a German sociologist, Max Weber, saw and wrote about about in 1904, something like that which is called the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism. Mm, sure. Weber saw that the only countries that, that first started capitalism were Calvinists. It was the Dutch in Holland, the Scots and the English, and the Dutch and English colonies in America in the 1600s, which one means that capitalism actually started with a moral force. It wasn't about greed. It was about the Calvinist vision of working hard and saving your money and and being practical. But capitalism was a new system which was born late 1500s, early 1600s. It blossoms in the the 18th century. And what is it? It's what you just said. It's the first system humanity has ever had for systematic wealth creation. If you look at all of For the individual, not for the king. For everybody. I mean, for the whole society. Right. And, And the king gets to benefit. Why? Because if everybody's wealthy, he can tax more, right? Um, whereas what I was going to say is... But in essence, it sort of led to the end of, in essence, these royal kingships that were in control of uh, these societies uh, uh, because, because it enabled people, in essence, to yes, yes, build and, a collective society yes, where they govern themselves. Yes, and, that, and this is where, where Marx has his insight about this industrial revolution and capitalism uh, started by the Protestant ethic, but it moves out, builds a middle class, the middle class then doesn't want to live under monarchical systems. And so Marx effectively talked about the American Revolution, the French Revolution, as the bourgeois class, middle class revolutions, which is, which is true, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but capitalism is a very special system that started in one particular point in time, and it gave us the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution gave us wealth. People say, this is, this is flip, but... Poor people in America today, 2019, live better than every ancient king and queen. I mean, if you're a poor person in Minneapolis today and you come down with in- influenza, you know, you go, to, you go to some place and you get a shot or you get some pills. If you were the king of France in, in 1492 or if you were Columbus in 1492 mm-hmm. and you got influenza on your ship sailing <laughs> over, you were a dead duck. Yeah. I mean, there was no medicine. There was no theory of germs. Are, oh, you, just, and just even the concept of what are the products and services that they had available to them then. Exactly. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. You know. and, and George Washington, for example, I mean, these things start coming to mind. He's, he dies. I, I was told once at Mount Vernon in his house because the, the treatment then was leaching. 
Right. They thought your blood was something. So they, they took so much blood out of his body to cure this disease that he, he died. Yeah. Because you know, they had absolutely no idea how the human body worked. Um, well, you, you know, uh, we need to take a break for five minutes. But after this break, let's explore just this whole idea of what is capitalism. Good, good, good. All right.
Well, welcome back. We're here with Stephen Young, uh, Global Executive Director of the Cow Roundtable for Moral Capitalism. We let off the last segment talking about some of the challenges that we've faced, but how capitalism has been a boon for humanity. Uh, maybe you can talk about what capitalism is. Well, um, it's, it's a good question, and, and thanks, Alan, because I think very few people these days stop to think about what, what is capital? Why is it different? from what went before or socialism or things like this. And there's lots of emotions, good and bad, about capitalism, usually around, well, capitalism is a system where the rich get rich and the poor stay poor, exploitation of the poor, or capitalism is a system that allows for human freedom, it, it supports democracy, and it supports innovation more than bureaucratic systems. Um, so the, I guess the central essence of capitalism is private property. Individuals have power. Capitalism empowers individuals through the device of private property. Raises a question, some people have more property than others. What about equality? What do we do about it? But if you have control over private property, the second thing capitalism has is it needs law. It needs the rule by law. You then take your private property and you can invent. You can invent a steam engine. You can, you can fill it, figure out how to build coal mines. You can invent uh, transistors. You can invent a smartphone. You can be a Steve Jobs, you can be a Thomas Edison, um, movies, uh, the, the telephonic communication, you know, the telegraph was invented uh, privately, use of private property. But I think the key- But at birth, you're not granted private property. Right, right. It's a social structure. Um, so someone has to grant some property to you. Well, well there are ru rules as to how you get property. And, and those are the law, and usually it's contract enforcement, and then there's the, there was the invention by the private sector of money. Mm -hmm. uh, money is now controlled by the government, but originally money was whatever you were willing to accept, cowrie shells in some cultures, um, gold in others. Mm -hmm. Paper money is a fairly modern invention. Uh, the whole financial system grew up around capitalism. So, but the, what capitalism does is self-sustaining. This is the key thing self-sustaining wealth creation. It's a system that goes on and on and on and on because it draws on uh, natural instincts, natural human desires, the control of property, inventiveness, and markets. The second big thing about capitalism you need is markets. I've got some place to go with my product, uh, my steam engine, and you want to buy it, and we've got, you have something that I want. Well, what's interesting which here, is, though, Which is money. Okay, but so now, now the system is off and running, and but, it, it just goes and goes and goes. Well, fundamentally, though, this word capital, is it just material? Is well, capital just material, or is there more to what we would say capital is in the word capitalism? There, there's much more to what it is, but, but the, the way our system has evolved and intellectually in business schools, it's, and thanks, I think, to Marx, we focus on the no notion of capitalism as money is finance. If you, if you understand the role, and Adam Smith, for example, as we said, never, he didn't talk about capital. He used the word stock. Stock was what you had to start a business. Mm -hmm. And it was a combination of money and it was maybe your, your land or something or other. But capital now is usually talked about as about finance. And, um, so I ask uh, students when I teach, say, you want to start, or I ask, usually I find somebody who started his own business or her own business. And I say, what was the first thing you needed? Nine times out of 10, the, the student or somebody will say money. I said, right. So how did you get the money? And then the whole class kind of stops. There's a pause. The person pauses. How did I get the money? Well, there are only two places you got the money from. One, you had it yourself because of savings or inheritance, or in most cases, you got it from somebody else. It was an investor. And the investor either put in what we call equity, risk money, or the investor gave you a loan. In many, many cases, when you start, you think about small entrepreneurs getting started, the money comes from relatives or friends or neighbors or somebody who knows you. What is the capital asset you have put on the table that they're betting on. One, it's you, right? It's human talent. It's human capital. Secondly, you probably have to come up with a business plan. You have to do some intellectual work. There's intellectual capital. Alan, if I ask you for, for $10,000 today, right now, Alan, give me $10,000. I'll make you a partner because I am going to 
um, start a little company in St. Paul making beer out of orange juice. And I say, show me your plan. And you will say, Steve, I mean, you'll say, yeah, show what, me your plan. What are the benefits to the consumer? Why would they buy it? Is the price, you know. Who are you yeah, going to hire? Where are you going to exactly. get your machines? What rent are you paying? Right, I want to see the model that you put together. I want to see the model. So, so the intellectual so, component. So there's so, so these different forms of capital. Also, a business needs social capital. You want, you want to start a business in Syria today? Probably not, right? There's no security. There's no rule of law. People will shoot you. They'll steal whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. You want to start a business in the United States? Probably. You want to start a business in Singapore with, with some senior Singapore people putting in capital and introducing you to all the banks? That's a slam dunk. Um, so we, we, we overlook human capital. We overlook intellectual capital. We overlook social capital. Part of social capital is cultural capital. Do you have the right ideas? Do you have a loyal workforce? Uh, do, are you inspired? Do you have, in the old days, the Protestant ethic of hard work? Are you, are you willing to yeah. delay gratification? Do you have something that aligns with the perceptions of society? Right, 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 right. Well, what, but you mentioned here, too, you threw in something else also, human capital. How does a business today value human capital? They and don't. How should they? Well, that, that's true. They, a, they don't. Because under our accounting conventions, which, by the way, our profit and loss statements in our balance sheets were invented before capitalism, right? Double entry bookkeeping goes yeah. back to, what, the monk in 1342? Right. I don't know. I mean, uh, and, and that was just accounting for cash, which, is, which is a, has no, nothing to do with the future, nothing to do mm -hmm. with planning. And the second thing, the balance sheet I read somewhere is, again, it's a late Middle Ages a device when people died, when a man died, did his estate balance? What that meant was, did he have enough um, liquid assets to pay off all his debts? Or you could just say, in, in, in simplified terms for our listeners, a balance sheet is just basically what do you have, and what do creditors own of what you have, and what do you own? And and there's a net, and <laughs> there's a it. net, there's a net. If you've got a net, then that's your, your private property. And then with businesses, what we basically did was we created this thing called an income statement that shows performance. Which, and, is, which is the P&L statement, which is the old P&L statement. And the P&L statement reflects profit, an profit and loss, hopefully yeah. an increase in profits or an increase of what you have in proportion to what creditors own of what you have. Well, except that the P&L statement only shows what you have earned cash-wise in the reporting period which in our system is usually either the quarter or the year. Mm -hmm. So you end up the year, right now it's January. Well, it depends on your quote-unquote fiscal year, right? Mm -hmm. But all companies which have to report by December 31 in January, they're going to show that we made, you'll see newspaper stories about this, you know, um, General Mills made $25 million in, in 2019. That's a net cash figure, which in accounting terms, then you have to transfer that as an asset to your balance sheet. But where I'm going with all this, Alan, is asking you, where on the P&L statement or the balance sheet do human beings, employees show up? Only as wages. Only as, only as a cost. There's no capital asset category on your balance sheet about the quality of the people you have who are actually making your business successful. To, to go back to this deeper analysis, your money doesn't make your business successful. It's what you do with your money, and that's your people. Well, and actually... Interestingly enough, thinking about the most valuable thing a person has is their time. And the majority of their time, their waking hours, I should say, they're giving to their employer. Now, the question is, is does that employer actually value this invaluable asset that a person is giving up to spend time, to spend their time with them? They're compensating them for their time. Is there any compensation that is sufficient? Well, this, this is opening up a whole... From a monetary standpoint, right, to compensate a, them for that. This, this is the whole issue of markets and, and well-being and what we measure and competition. Uh, if you look at the person basically as cash wages, I think most thinking in business is taught by business schools is you balance that against y y the cost of your goods or service sold. So if I pay you $10 an hour, at the end of the day, I have to include that cost with all my other costs, and am I making a profit? And then we at the co-roundtable, I believe, profits are very, very important, but for sort of another reason, profits allow you to keep going. That's all the indicators, you can keep going. Uh, they don't really lead to a deeper sense of value or worth or achievement. 
And you hire people in a free market, free labor market economy because you're paying them $6.99 an hour. Somebody's willing to work for $6.99. On the ethical side, the, 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 this system says it's up, to the pers- it's up to the worker to decide whether he or she um, is going to work for you for six ninety nine, you don't make them as the decision as to whether you are sufficiently compensating them for the contribution of their time. They have the right power and authority to do that. But then Marx pointed out, and other people have pointed out on the labor side, that there's a power imbalance in bargaining. There are not that many jobs. And if you don't have a lot of skills, basically you have to take the crumbs if you're an unskilled person, you have to take the crumbs that society is sort of dropping before you. And that's why today, in many countries, in the movement in the United States, to say that the state has to step in and limit the free market and say there has to be a floor. You have to pay at least ten ninety nine an hour or $15 an hour. And as a lot of you know, the viewers will know, that's called a living wage. This also, again, moving forward, this whole notion of valuing workers by cash is responsible for a lot of the offshoring of production Mm -hmm. to cultures and societies which have lower economic standards who pay less. So you're making, you're making a cell phone. You want to make a cell phone in America where you got to pay people, you know, $75 an hour who are really smart, or you're going to get that same skill in China for $10 an hour. I should say the the federal minimum wage in the United States, I believe is in the Seven to eight dollar range. It hasn't been raised in a while, yeah. and uh, and there's states that have uh, have elected to raise it beyond that. Well, here uh, in Minnesota, I think we're going, it's going to twelve, maybe? twelve, and then it's going to go to fifteen in another couple of years. But, um, but just this whole idea, even of if someone receiving, let's say, eight dollars an hour on uh, minimum wage, that's sixteen thousand a year. When you think about what can they afford, what kind of quality of life can they have outside of work, separate from what is the quality of life within their work environment. But then there's this concept of the human being uh, and the organization and the stakeholders of the organization. Uh, I used to hear all the time in movies growing up and when I went to work in different places, the customer is always right. You know, you'd hear those types of things. Uh, is the customer the only stakeholder of an organization? Well, no, clearly not the only stakeholder, but... There, there is a realistic logic to saying the customer is always right, I think, in the sense that somebody's got to buy your product or your service. If you can't sell it, you're bankrupt because, in effect, you have not produced anything that somebody wants. Now, we always get this issue of how to, you know, what are the coins, tokens, symbols of value that can be exchanged? And we come down to money, uh, which is easy to use. It's very efficient, but it limits a lot of our thinking about about people but But if somebody's not willing to to give you their money then whatever you're doing has no future but what's interesting to think about and this is sort of a an evolution in our thought processes is that 50 years ago maybe that focus was gosh that customer you know is always right or that you have to produce that value for that customer they're not going to buy but more so today maybe we're evolving and maybe this whole concept of capitalism is evolving in that we're looking at not just the customer but we're looking at an ecosystem in which value is being provided by suppliers by employees by investors and by customers the transaction of value is different in relationship to each of those stakeholders but every one of those stakeholders is important but they're all important but the key the key transaction is the sale and that turns on what the customer is willing to pay. And this comes, this all flows right back to issues of, of the protecting the environment and sustainability and, and other things. If only customers would pay more money, we could, we could do a lot of things. The question is, will they? Do they really want to? There are a lot of people who will talk, but they'll still buy the cheaper product. Um, well, that's a good point. I'm, I'm trying to think of sort of some example. One that comes to mind is free trade coffee. There are, there are a lot of people and a lot of coffee drinkers who tend to be middle class or upper, people who use uh, Starbucks or all the other competing companies now. Um, they also have on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they've got something other than just the need for liquid refreshment. 
They've got a social conscience. They've got self-actualization. And they are willing, many of them are, to pay more money for a cup of coffee with the knowledge that that extra increment, instead of four ninety five, they're going to pay six bucks for a cup of coffee. Uh, that extra dollar they know is going to go directly to the coffee growers in Costa Rica or Ecuador or someplace like that. So their satisfaction is basically two things. One is the coffee at a reasonable price. Secondly, an intangible factor of being charitable. The issue is how many people are like that? How many people can be like that? We and have that, 93 that, million that, Americans that are food and shelter insecure. And that, that's, an, an that's an, the next point, which goes back again to, to the, the material, physical sort of low-level needs versus the higher-order needs, and it's the amount of money you have. Because if you don't have a lot of money, the marginal utility for you of each additional penny is serious. So therefore, I would get a $2 cup of coffee, and I'd only do it once or twice a week because I don't have a lot of money. Each dollar for me is important. If I'm a millionaire, I don't care about an additional dollar. It's extra marginal utility is basically zero. I will have somebody get me a, you know, a very expensive latte with stuff added on it and things like that uh, two or three times a day. I don't even notice the cost. And then that other people, that angers other people who say, well, who, who gave you, you know, the opportunity to be a millionaire? So the Ka round table from World Capitalism has a set of principles. They're broken out, I believe, into three categories, one for business, one for government, but then there's one for citizenship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we also focused on ownership. It was a very interesting conversation because the movement of business ethics and corporate social responsibility, now sustainability, about started in the mid-90s, uh, focused on the corporation, the business entity. And they mostly focused on big corporations. And I was talking to a guy here in Minnesota, a guy named Joe Silvaggio, who used to be a Catholic Dominican priest, left the, the, the church after Vatican II and went into providing housing for poor people. And I had a marvelous track record here of providing housing and working with the people in a kind of mentoring way. So they paid their rent on time. They didn't trash the apartments. He could get mortgages. He could build more. It was a marvelous example of using um, values and culture and intangible capital quality tenants in order to drive finance to build mm-hmm. more houses. So I was, I, somebody said, Steve, you're new to the co-round table. You want to go talk to Joe? And, and I, I knew Joe, and I said, great idea. So I had coffee with Joe, and um, he started out the conversation saying, Steve, you're wasting your time. I said, what? You, Joseph Azio, mm-hmm. you're saying that, that goodness and capitalism is a waste of time? He said, everybody, you know, in this corporate, but then we talked about CSR. Corporate social responsibility. He said, everybody talks about the company. What about the owners? Mm-hmm. And I had a moment of enlightenment because he's absolutely right. Even in a huge company like General Motors or General Electric or whatever, if the stakeholders agree, that company can do anything. If you go to the stakeholders uh, or the shareholders, sorry, if you go to the shareholders in a general meeting and say, we want to double our wages for our employees – the company has to do that because the owners have, but nobody ever talks about the ethical obligations of owners mm. in a system of private property. Right. Uh, you, I presume you own a house somewhere. Let's take that. You own a house, you own mm-hmm. a piece of property, you have a backyard, you have a front yard. Are you un- under any moral obligations as to what you do with your property? Can you just dump trash in your backyard? Can you turn your property into an eyesore? Can you rent it out for bad purposes? No. Do we ever talk about this? Very few. You know, some people, you know, but we really don't. Uh, you, you own a car, right? You own a car. As the owner of a car, which is spewing out, you know, greenhouse gases, what are your ethical and moral obligations as a car owner? I never see anybody talk about that. I have, I have, uh, I have $10,000 in the bank account, in the savings account. I'm an owner of $10,000. What are my ethical obligations? Just leave it there to accumulate interest? Should I take 1% a year and give it to poor people? So we, we, we came up with some principles trying to focus on, on the power that you have as an owner of private property. What, but, is, what is responsible use of that power? Well, when I think of the car on table for moral capitalism, though, I'm basically coming to the conclusion that 
the membership of the Caron table and the leadership of the Caron table has decided that capitalism as it stands isn't good enough, that it needs to be somehow redesigned. Uh, to, incl- to, to focus more on these intangible forms of capital and stakeholders. Okay. It's got to be an ecosystem, not just a company. So expand upon that concept that you're telling me about. It's got to be more of an ecosystem. Is that more getting back to what we were talking about, that there's all these stakeholders? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and is it, so, it's, so when we talk about moral capitalism, does moral capitalism currently exist? Or what is the, out, what is the end point we're trying to achieve? Well, I would say, I would, on one level, I would say, and this is sort of what Adam Smith argued and then people disagree with him, is that any capitalism is at some basic level a moral system because it depends on reciprocity. The system only works if various people agree to participate. It's a voluntary system. Okay. Um, so that's but, different than communism right, or, right. or where, where, the, where the government tells you what to do. And in essence, it, when and, we say communism or socialism, we could also say that that connects to fascism. Because absolutely, absolutely. You have the, then the ruling individual well, but, who but decides what everyone's going to but, have. But there's also another thing on fascism, which we need to, to learn more about because we've forgotten about it, um, is that fascism com- comes out of socialism. Fascism is another form of socialism. And, and expand upon that. Yeah, and we tend to, because I think of Hitler and, and the, the Holocaust and the way people talk about it is that, so, so there's the fascist or right-wing people right? And communists and socialists are left-wing people. But do you happen to remember the, the name of Hitler's party, the Nazi party? What does Nazi stand for? I don't know. What does it National stand for? National Socialist. Oh. The name of Hitler's party was the National Socialist German Workers' Party, mm. founded in 1919. In Italy, at the same year or a year later, Mussolini f- founds his own, I can't remember, fascisti, Fascism is an Italian word, fascisti, which goes back to the um, Roman fascis. The Roman fascis was the symbol of authority of the Roman consul, which was a bundle. I think it was 10 sticks, Mm -hmm. 10 sticks, which were put in a bundle. And it was sort of there was a band around it. And I think it maybe had an axe coming out. The point was Soviet Union also. It's the group solidarity. Right. The old Roman point was if if if. If you have one stick, I can break it. If you give me a bundle of 10 sticks together, I can't break the bundle. So if all of us Romans, if we stick together in our legions, we can conquer anybody. And that's what they did. So Mussolini takes this and he develops this notion of socialism for one people. The Italian people, the fascisti, they all come together. Hitler did the same thing. It's a socialist model for the German people. And if you, I ran across recently by accident, the 1919 political program of the National Socialist German Workers Party, it's just like the Green New Deal of AOC and, and the left wing. Oh, now, interesting. What happens was, I, mean, I started, I was so puzzled by this. I said, God, in the, it was always in the 19th century, there were two streams of socialism, but there was a big division in like the 1880s. The, the, the one we always talk about and we think about communism, socialism, communism, left wing, was international socialism. This was Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, representing all the workers of the world as one class. Mm-hmm. No attention to national boundaries or anything. It was just it was the, the workers against the, the plutocrats. Separately, there was the, the socialism of commun- first communes, and then it became syndicalists in France in the 1880s. It was the Paris Commune or something like that. The Mussolini and, his, and the people who founded his party came from the syndicalist tradition. Mm. And Hitler piggybacked on that. So this national socialism is socialism for one country tied to an ethnic group with a dictator. I mean, that's what we have in Venezuela. What, 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 the international communism... After the collapse of the Soviet Union and Mao, it was, it's gone. What we have are national socialisms, which have dictatorial parties where the government controls everything. And so this 
concept of capitalism is empowering the individual to build wealth and freedom for themselves. That's what I would argue. The people on the left or, or, or now on this national socialism, they would argue against me. But I would argue that every example of a national socialism uh, is, is a repressive structure dominated by a government, the police power. And the police and the government are dominated by, by some self-appointed clique. So the idea of the Chiron table for moral capitalism then is, is to help us individually build our freedom and our build our quality of life and our forms of capital, okay. which 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 I think is if we have to look at the ecosystem and build up the human capital and the social capital and the cultural capital, and 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 have those as checks and balances against finance capital. So, in this next segment that we're going to have, we're going to take a five minute break here. Um, let's explore this whole idea of how do we accomplish the goal. And we'll circle back to, to talking about the U.S. Business Roundtable, which formally accepted, seems to the Car Roundtable principles. Um, and even in Davos, we were discussing previously also that they've basically adopted Car principles without formally identifying that they have. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's take a five minute break.
Well, welcome back. We have Stephen Young, Global Executive Director of the Cairo Roundtable for Moral Capitalism. Uh, and we're going to talk about the Cairo Roundtable, Davos, um, the uh, U.S. Business Roundtable. In essence, I would say there's a metamorphosis, an evolution that's occurring before us in the things that we're doing. We talked about these other systems like fascism, communism, socialism, where the, in essence, we probably could agree that there's a select few that just sort of control everything. Um, but here we are in this capitalist model, and this idea of the capitalist model uh, is one, and tell me if I'm wrong, one in which we are empowering the individual to make decisions and to build a better world collectively for us as a participant voluntarily in that process versus being a controlled participant in that process. We're looking forward at some big challenges environmentally, human you know, from a human development standpoint, from a collective community building standpoint. We definitely have dealt, in essence, with a very selfish dynamic that has had positive impacts and negative impacts in this process. And as we're going forward in it, trying to address these issues, in essence, we could say 25 years ago, with the establishment of the Car Roundtable principles, uh, we've now emerged into a time where broader, in a broader based sense in society, people are recognizing the value of those principles. That we actually need to be thinking carefully about moral capitalism in the context of government action, in the context of business action, in the context of citizen action. So in essence, we could say that the Car Round Table is a cultural shaping entity that's trying to empower us as individuals to make better decisions. Well, yes, I think you can generally, but with a, with a narrow focus on how should companies in the capital system uh, Big, middle, and small make decisions, which means you have to get into management metrics and things like new forms of balance sheets and this and accounting for your outcomes. And, and um, But it also could include marketing. It can include supply chain. Uh, or, everything include about a business done, things. all the different stakeholders. Right, 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 right. But I was thinking, as you were pointing alternative, um, so basically we only have two sort of alternatives looking into this future. Uh you have, you have individuals uh, who are empowered who can use what the, uh, the, the power of the consumer dollar to buy new and different things which will deal with the environment. And, for example, if you come to a conclusion that cell phones are really not very good, you stop buying them. Mm -hmm. And then Apple and Google and all these other people, in order to continue in business, they will change their product. They will re-engineer their product to give consumers what they want. Well, how can consumers be educated to do that? They do have power. If you assume that people do have power, are valuable, are individuals, have freedom, then to some extent a major way out is that they have to act uh, and collectively, and somebody has to give them uh, or encourage them to act in various ways. Now, they, ha they have to come to believe in something. Now, let me ask you this, though. You know, We're in a situation in which we have young people who are distracted by media. Uh, we have... Uh, different societies with different value systems, uh, different class structures. How do we influence organizations that are global and local in, in local areas to collectively come together to address decisions? I mean, isn't it easier to think about the idea that rather than trying to create an organization that influences lots of people to make good decisions, is that possible? Is it easier to think about the idea of, hey, we could put together a committee of people who could just control everything and make good decisions? That, I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. Once, <laughs> once again, you're back at these, these, these deep, profound questions about our species, about human life. And, and to me, with my background in law and political science, what you just said at the end, put together a small group, that, we, was, we, that was basically Plato's recommendation in the Republic. You have a philosopher king who never makes a mistake, who tells everybody else what to do. Well, that, know, that, that then raises the problem, who among us is that philosopher king? Well, interestingly, when I was reading Thomas Jefferson's memoirs, he was speaking about George Washington as this very wise, thoughtful person who is taking into account everyone's 
interests and perspectives in carefully thinking about how to rule effectively in his decision making. And as a matter of fact, at that time, because people looked at him as such a wise philosopher king per, per se, there were some that were even contemplating that maybe he should be the first king of the United States rather than we having yeah, uh, having a yeah, democracy. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, yeah. Because and, people didn't trust a lot of they don't trust the ordinary people. They and, actually don't trust systems of democracy and freedom and individualism. Well, if people aren't aware, if they're not informed, and they haven't built up wisdom and experience, how can they make decisions that are going to benefit that's the that's the classic argument that's the classic argument of the autocrats of the aristocrats of the of the conservatives um there's something to it but if you believe that people are not necessarily like that then you have to commit yourself to education to moral education to empowering people um, you got to trust people to some extent to to be wise about but, themselves. And, and wouldn't you say to make this work for the long run? Though we need to build wealth, we need to build wisdom. You think we you need can, to, you, you, and you can't get you can't and we need get to do it broad based. Right, right. You can't get work. schools. You can't get schools and colleges without wealth. You can't get wealth without I think without markets and capitalism. So the one hand is you you believe in people, and you say you are important, but you have to be responsible. So there's moral education. There's character building. Washington was famous and his generation was famous uh, for, for focusing on character. And Washington and many people in his generation went back to this Roman guy, Cicero, who wrote about a person of good character integrates what is honest and good with what is prudent and pragmatic. Most people say either you got to be good or, you, or you're going to be rich. What this tradition says is no, no, in, you can be good and well-to-do. Actually, you bring up something interesting, Dale Carnegie. Uh, what was he espousing? Uh, that you have to be, uh, that you can be, you, you become rich, then you do something good? I can't remember you know, exactly Andrew, what that was. Uh, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Brent, Andrew Carnegie, sorry. Andrew Carnegie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but his thing, I mean, is um, he was influenced by, uh, make, as, make as much money as you can any way that you can, and then once you've made it, give it away. Right, which I think, right. it, which I just think, is just wrong. I mean, you know, it's yeah, how exactly. it's how you make your money. But a lot of people do that today. Though. A lot of people because we've got this. We we have an, so so the solution is on the societal level. How do you get society values, and how do you do that in a world where there are you know Christians and then secularists and then they're Chinese with their own ideology and, and, with Muslims? Wouldn't you say we're driving just in the opposite we're direction going the right opposite now? Direction. Instead because of so, being com together as a community, building community, building the value community, right. we've got all these individuals, one off. Right, right, right. So one of the things that we're, we're trying to do at the, at the Co Roundtable is take our, our principles for business of responsibility about stakeholders and link them to the different religious and wisdom traditions, which we've done, I think, quite successfully. Though we're really small and tiny, too tiny. Um, so, for example, take two large areas of it. The Chinese are sort of, they think their time has come in human history. Um, but to go to the Chinese and say, wait a moment, you have different values in your system. Some of your values are about, about empire and this and that, but you've got other values from Confucius and Mencius, which are really very close to Buddhism, to the Koran table, to Christianity, to this or that. With Islam, we have interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith of the Prophet which support the Koran table principles. So we can go to Muslims and say, you can be good Muslims and active concerned citizens with business, with finance, in, in helping in helping the culture, helping the environment, and helping create wealth. But how do you get these um, groups to build their own community so that they well, can adapt these things? No, that too? That, that goes th that, that goes to the whole question of implementation. It's not enough to have a great big nice ideal or moral vision. You have to bring it down to guidelines, to metrics, to things that get managed and measured. But if all the principles of the different religions support responsibility, you let them start, their, start from wherever they are. You're Protestant, you're Catholic, you're Jewish, you're Muslim, you're Buddhist, you're Chinese, whatever, whatever. You're African traditions, you're Native American traditions. But you come down to say, yes, we accept that we all have to be responsible. Then you give everybody the same set of guide, guidelines, how to take care of the environment, how to consider the well-being of workers, how to build up education, how to have moral culture in your company. How do you get people to show up? How do you get people to show up? 
and, and not just show up bodily, but to show up mentally and spiritually well, as well. I will, I will say this, that when you had your conference a few weeks ago, the Ka Conference in downtown Minneapolis, the Minneapolis Club, when I came there, the exciting part for me wasn't just the speakers that were speaking. It was the people that were there. And my first thought process was, which was probably the thought process of everybody else was, hey, let's get to know each other. Uh, let's interact with each other. Let's build relationships. Davos, it's the same sort of thing, and uh, you know, with on steroids. I mean, it's but but it's, limited, but limited to who's there, right? Limited to to who's there. And the key thing, though, is is those people that show up. In essence, they become a community. Uh, I think you had mentioned to me, and others have mentioned to me this as well, that for example, going to the Minneapolis Club. Uh, you had mentioned that, and tell me if I'm wrong, when you were uh, the dean of the law school at Hamlin, you'd come into the Minneapolis Club and you'd be introduced to a series of different people. In essence, it's one thing reading about somebody in a newspaper article and then sending them an email or sending them a letter or calling them on the phone cold and they have no idea who you are. It's another thing being in an environment in which there's somebody that you know that's And, and, and those environments in, uh, or that are, you meet are, and you, you get to know. They're social capital. And they create cultural cap, but they don't. They exist less and less as we're breaking down into our own little, little cliques, our little, and even individuals where we don't trust anybody. The higher the level of mistrust in a society, the harder it is to bring people together. And now, you know, parents are scheduling play dates for their kids. They send their kids away to college. They're focusing on their own career, their own trajectory, their own path. It's not about, hey, am I going to come back to Minneapolis and help build Minneapolis? No, I'm living in such and such place, and there's a job there. And it doesn't matter where it is in the world. It's what's going to help me enrich myself. But, and, it, and enrich so, in a material sense, I think, more than in a moral, intellectual, spiritual, communitarian sense. But if we look at Minnesota and its, its foundational families that really were bu big builders here, the Weyerhausers, the, the McMillans, the, 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 uh, um, the Dayton family, and so on and so forth, uh, these were people that were entrenched here, building their families here, building the future here with their families and the community. Have we lost that? And, well, yes, and, and yes, is, yes. And is yes, that yes, a key yes. ingredient that's missing? Like when we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation that, you know, do we have a, in essence, moral community that we're building here or that's, anywhere for that's, that matter? I mean, going back to one of your introductory comments, if you look at American politics today, you see any George Washingtons? You see any Abraham Lincolns? <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't. As a matter of fact, it, when we were having our discussion in the afternoon after after the meeting, uh, there was a fellow from uh, Duluth who owns a bar there who came. And uh, he was saying that there's a bunch of corporations that have moved into Duluth, and the people leading them are very transient. So Yeah, the, the franchise of... Franchises like you know Starbucks or, or McDonald's, which buy the shops, and they're now serving the people of Duluth... But it's all hired employees. It's not the owners do not live in Duluth. But even the managers that come in are transient managers They'll that are not intending for, on staying right. there or building the communities there. Right, right, because they're going to move to a better position somewhere else in two, or three or four years. Right. So this world we're building, globalization, they call it. Yeah, this world we're building. It seems like we, if we're going to get to where we need to go, we have to make us either globally local or locally local in terms of our building forward. I mean, the principles. Well, know, what, well what, we, what we think, and, and I know we're running out of time, is that one, the stakeholder concept, if you believe in it and if you live it. So if you're um, someone from Iowa and you're assigned to Duluth, Minnesota to run the, the Starbucks franchise there, um, and you understand stakeholders and you understand the importance of community and the schools and you will behave differently. You'll behave kind of like an old fashioned resident. So do we give people the guidelines, but then we have to give them the motivations. Uh, but, but this, this can be done. Um, but I think the other thing is, is Alan, I think we haven't yeah. talked about it. You mentioned it earlier briefly is some notion of citizenship. If everybody's yes. a citizen, you have your responsibilities as a citizen, whether you're wealthy, middle class, or poor. 
And part of your obligations as a citizen is to care for the community around you. And that's, and that's a sense of personal power. But what I, what I worry about is we no longer take a sense of pride in being a citizen. Because if you're proud as a citizen and you're proud of yourself, you tend to do more. You're more willing to go to meetings. You're more willing to bring people together. You'll, you'll try to come up with a compromise or something. And, you, and, you know. and at the Kai event a few weeks ago, when Paul Pullman spoke so eloquently and Doug Baker spoke so eloquently, in essence, being there and being with this group, I felt like I was a citizen of that group, of a moral group that was together to try to have great impact. And, uh, you know, my perspective is, is that the U.S. Business Roundtable, if I was at those meetings, I'd probably feel similar, no, no, possibly. That's the new look to the roundtable. In the past, you would not have, because they would in the past, they and Davos were much more focused on, if you will, the... Uh, the economics. The economics and the material, the pecuniary, um, the self-interested part of, of the capitalist system. So now they're... They're moving they're, towards... They're recognizing that something needs to evolve, but I don't think they have the details in their heads yet as to where to go next. So we hope to be helpful to them. So where, where, does, where should we go next as a society in terms of, you know, if Ka's mission is to be realized? You know, you have principles for government, you have principles for business, you have principles for citizenship, you have principles for owners... Where do we need to go? Well, I think, it, I mean, very simply, it's education. It's, it's, the, it's what we as human beings have done that separates us from the other creatures, right? Is we it every individual? Is every, it is every, early childhood education? It's, it's, it's everything. I mean, it's got to start with parents. It starts at birth. It's early childhood education. It's elementary. It's this. It's business schools. I mean, I think all the business school curriculums need to be updated around this new theory. Corporations have to take, and companies have to take responsibility for their employees in, in, in the educational process. Schools of public administration need to teach a real sense of, like Washington, someone who, who, who earns trust, doesn't, doesn't demand it, but earns trust through being responsible and listening to other people. You know, interestingly enough, when I look at the car on table principles, uh, you know, you just, I look at them, I say, these are common sense. Um, respect rules and conventions, support responsible globalization, respect the environment. Uh, yeah, it's not rocket science. Respect stakeholders beyond shareholders. You know, contribute to economic and social development. Uh, it seems like, you know, fundamentally these principles, even though you say, gosh, the common table is focused just from a business standpoint, but you do have principles for government, principles for citizenship. It's a it's an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem because business capitalism cannot succeed unless the, unless the ecosystem is helpful, encouraging, supporting, and sustaining. So for our listeners, if they want to have an impact, as an individual, it's difficult to have an impact. As a group, it's easier. Well, one thing how, is— How do we get people, you know, how I mean, do people show up? A person listening to this, how do, we, how, how do they say, gosh, okay, so what do I do now? So what you could do, and what any individual could do, is you go to our website, you take a set of principles, and you, you talk to friends and family, and you call a meeting, you take them to your Rotary Club, you take them to your, your okay. business, you take them to your church, and say, can we talk about this? And you get a conversation started. So here's an interesting thing. We live in a, and there's something just to close with, but we live in a very polarized time. As we talked about in the very beginning, there's somebody who just looks out on the media and they see somebody they don't agree with and they automatically vilify them, possibly. Whatever happened to respectful disagreement, oh, yeah, challenge? Yeah, yeah. How important that discussion isn't just about saying, okay, here's principles, but understanding, right? So fostering understanding is an important part in all of this. With, res with respectful to conversation, which is ultimately the basis of civilization. I mean, when you say here, respect, you know, uh, respect stakeholders beyond shareholders, there's a whole discussion that's important to foster in association with understanding those things. Yes. I guess the key thing that I'm thinking about is, is just that with organizations like the Chiron Table, uh, can, a, can an individual that is a college student that's 20 years old become a member? Well, anybody can become a member, but we're not, we're a small network. We don't have chapters, but what we try to do is put everything in the public domain. 
and, and use things like this podcast and thank you for your help with this. So people say, and they might, something might, there'll be sort of a flash of recognition or something. And they say, oh, I'll take this. I can do something. Yeah, I think the important thing just to emphasize in all of this is, and you know, to our listeners, uh, is that the Car Roundtable and LUAT and many other organizations are out there and we're trying to, in essence, build a network of relationships that hopefully will span the globe and will encourage discussion and education and development and growth towards addressing the major environmental and, and human development challenges that we face so that we can all experience a more prosperous and, and better world for the future. And, uh, and when we talk about the whole concept of moral capitalism, I think one of the most valuable things we talked about today was that capitalism is about giving freedom to the individual to build wealth, to build a better world, and not under the control or purview of some small group of individuals who are going to control the few. If we're going to have that power, we have to address that power responsibly. Yes, exactly. Um, with empathy and compassion for, for our fellow person. Exactly. And the only way we're going to get there is if we work together as a community, build or, communities, moral communities. <coughs> Excuse me, Alan. <coughs> but maybe the first step in getting there is we've got to believe in ourselves. And we have to respect ourselves, probably. Respect yourself, process. absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, Steve. Thank you very much. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you, too. And uh, looking forward to further conversations. So, so do I. So do I. All right. Great.